So is there any plans for restarting Ireland then? Yeah, uh, there's a phased approach, which kind of starts, if you're a central worker, really the beginning of July. But it's as vague as hell, you know. Um, I, I think the government are right to kind of lock down because they didn't know what was happening, but they don't really have an exit strategy. And they're kind of leaving that to the individuals to try and figure out. So to whip the whole nation into a frenzy. And now it has to kind of decompress that, which will take many months. So we're hope so so crashes can open for not for essential workers in the end of July, and then non-essential workers for the beginning of August. I assume in time for the schools to go back. Yeah, and we've got our leaving cert, which is like A levels, right? Uh, which is supposed to happen, and they've been cancelled, right? So there'll be a whole political thing of what your what grade your child will get. <clears throat> and that's going on. But I've also set our precedent as way well, as well as if if they won't let those leaving certain A-levels happen. Uh, what's it mean for schools going back in September, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, this, this environment suits me fine working from home, but I got three young kids, you know, which is, that that's hard, right? And um, with two of us working, they're being neglected. And the two boys are, are eight going nine and, and six, and they're almost like teenagers, but my four-year-old daughter needs attention and structure, you know? So she'll, I mean, she thinks it's great, but there's no structure for her. And she can be quite demanding, you know, uh, as, as four-year-olds can be. Um, so if we could go back to creche or some sort of childcare facility, this, this would be great. I could do this forever. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think quite a lot of technical people really are feeling that. They uh, they found this wonderful balance at home. They can look after their mm. kids a little bit um, and they can get their work done. Um, so I think there is going to be some dramatic changes in the future. Yeah. yeah, but even right, look at the, the policies, right? You're gonna have if you're gonna open up an office, you're gonna have to be able to sit two meters away from another person, which is going to be nigh on impossible to do because you know, certainly in our place you have lifts and you have stairs, right? So, you know, what are you gonna do? Stand at the bottom of, of the stairs and have a kind of a seven four system? You know, it means you can't fully populate the building. <clears throat> and then the other argument is uh, we've got six offices in, in that campus, right? Six big buildings. And now the question is do we need all of them? You know. Um, my wife works for, for a bank here and, and they were looking to renew their city centre head office. They said, you know what, maybe we don't. Maybe we just use the smaller offices around Dublin. Save some costs there, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's quite a lot of people, um, various departments I've been speaking to, they're not bringing people back at all. Um, so yeah, yeah it, it seems as if there's going to be uh, a lot of buildings um, available for cheaper rent, which would yeah. be interesting, shall we say. <sighs> Certainly will. You know, it's done well for Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I'd bought some shares. Ah, stop. Yeah. You know, they're they're on Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. We got, we uh, yes, them. congratulations on yeah. that one. Well done. Well done. Yeah, yeah. So delighted with that. All right, we're just waiting on some people to join. Have you got a cup of tea ready for you? Uh, I have water. Right. So oh. I, I I stopped drinking tea and coffee around one o'clock. You know. So I could sleep at night. Yeah, my girlfriend forces me to drink non-caffeine tea uh, late at night. What's the point? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know. I just drink water at night. Okay. So we've got about, there's about 10 people in here. Yeah. Um, we've got about 23 on the live stream already. Okay. Uh, so we'll give it about another 10 minutes and then we'll kick yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, that... yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think you've booked three hours. Three, I, I booked in for two. That, that's the permission I have from my wife, right? <laughs> so this, this I, it's absolutely fine. I just thought three hours just in case it went over for Q&A or yeah. uh, just how in-depth it went. So, yeah. That's last actually. time it was just under two hours. So it was about an hour presentation and we had Q&A and I stopped for questions. So, you know, uh, let me see if I can share screen share. Do, do, do. Two, let's see if that works. Oh, it's actually, no, I need to stop. Sit around. <clears throat> I need to share. Water. Okay, just to check that. How's that? Do you see that? Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, okay. And what's that?
Yeah, to be honest, I wasn't expecting people to be ordered back to work in the UK this week. Uh, that's why I did it sort of middle of the afternoon. I thought we yeah. were all going to be still uh, on the furlough sort of thing. Yeah, the, the government are more or less making a dual decision, if you like, right? But um, I don't see maybe Christmas, maybe after Christmas, if things go back to normal, you know? Um, and I don't like this concept of new normal. It is, this is abnormal. Right? You get back to normality. You need to get on a plane and go meet people and live a life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right, we just get Joran just joined us. Um, he's another community advocate as, as well, Ian. Ah, he's on a PC without mic and camera. He's just going to be doing the admin work for us in the background. Uh, so if anybody starts asking questions and things like that, you can jump on board. Cool. Oh, nice. Oh, Kate's on. Hey. I think we've got about 80 people watching so far. We'll wait to hit about 100 or something. Yeah, whatever you want. Sure. I think that should do. We've got about a hundred people. Okay. Uh, yeah, Ian, whenever you'd like to, to sure. go, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you very much to the Chainlink community for inviting me on. Um, this is a lecture I usually give to students that come and visit us in, in Oracle, in Oracle offices. And uh, for those of you out there, we were supposed to have Chainlink, a Chainlink meetup in the, the Oracle offices in Dublin, but you have to settle for Zoom and we'll take a rain check and we'll get you guys over to Dublin. And um, it is uh, one we have a safe harbor statement. As I'm an Oracle employee, this is my get out of jail clause. Now, the good news here is about 90% of what I'm telling you is my own personal opinion. There's, there's very little about Oracle, but just so we're covered, uh, this is my get out of jail free card. Quote of the day um, I picked this chap, Arthur C. Clark. Arthur was a renowned scientist who worked early on the telecommunications satellite. And I put him up here for two reasons. Uh, number one is he wrote a book called 2001, A Space Odyssey, which I'm sure some of you have heard. And uh, Stanley Kubrick, the, the director of the film. And in that movie, you had two astronauts, which was Frank and Dave. Uh, Frank used to play chess with the computer called HAL, which was an AI computer. And um, uh, Dave used to have 
congenial chats in the morning. And what happened was in the, in the book, uh, Hal had a secret mission, which didn't tell his, his compatriots. Um, and the Hal's secret mission was about to become compromised and Hal had to make a decision between his mission or putting his lives of, of his crew in jeopardy. And uh, needless to say, shenanigans unfolded. So for those of you who saw the movie, you know what happened. For those of you who didn't, go watch the movie. It's a great movie. So I picked Arthur for, for the AI piece, because we're going to talk about that today. And also, um, it's a great quote, is that we tend to overestimate what we can do in one year and greatly un underestimate what we can do in three years. And I think given the space that we're in now with AI and blockchain and so on, we tend to be a little bit impatient when things will get done. And you know, we overestimate what we can do in one year, but when you look back and reflect what you've done in three years, you, you would be amazed. So let's cover the objectives for today. Um, I'm going to provide an overview of the fourth industrial revolution and explore the impact of the singularity on humanity. We're going to present three, the key characteristics in the following areas, Internet of Things, Artificial Intelligence, Blockchain and Distributed Ledgers, and I'm going to explore the synergies between these three technologies and discuss how a new era of commerce is enabled through the combination of these three technologies. And then we're going to explore some challenges and opportunities. And I just want to acknowledge at this time, this presentation is based on a module I did in college uh, called Emerging Topics and Practical Consideration of Blockchains from my master's degree. So credit to Dr. Elias Yosef, but I did make this presentation my own. So the agenda, which is similar to objectives, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to myself and my background. We're going to look at the fourth industrial revolution and the fourth human revolution. Uh, look at AI, sorry, into other things, AI, blockchain. Look at the convergence of these three technologies into a future technology stack. And then I'm going to give you briefly where Oracle fits into the fourth uh, industrial revolution. And we'll look at um, conclusions and maybe have time for Q&A. So I'm 27 years in the IT industry, so I've been around a while. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've just completed a master's degree in digital currency in March at the University of Nicosia. And uh, that was the first time I was introduced to Chainlink. Um, it was part of a course I did where we looked at oracles. So we would have looked at um, Oracleize, which is provable. I think they're as a partner of yours now. And uh, the town crier model and, um, the, and Chainlink as well. And then separately, you guys then joined the Oracle Startup Program. That would have been, I think, May, June last year. So that, that was how I got connected to like, with Chainlink. My day job is to manage 26 solution engineers and solution architects, specializing in Oracle's technology stack, which includes data management, infrastructure service, big data, business analytics, integration, application development, blockchain, information security. And my role is to help customers both pre and post sales support. I help sales reps, customers, partners, ISVs, and, and of course startups, which is why I'm here today. So moving along, so let's have a look at the fourth industrial revolution. Well, what's the first industrial revolution? It's considered that, you know, when we had um, water powered mills, you know, beside a river, they were used to turn a wheel, used for production to make woolen mills and corn mills and so on. And that evolved into the steam engine. And the steam engine then allowed factories to move from remote countryside into a city. And that allowed you know, a greater workforce so you could hire more people, you could manufacture goods and be close to those people to sell those goods, right? So that kind of gave us a second industrial revolution. And then the third, uh, uh, the, sec sorry, the second industrial revolution, um, we had the steam engines went on to electrical engines and the electrical engines that were replaced by the, the electrical grid and so on, right? That reduced uh, the barrier for, for smaller uh, uh, companies to come in and compete. And it's generally agreed that the third industrial revolution is where we are now. It gives rise to instant access to information, can drive automation and efficiencies. An example would be cloud computing or even what we use today, which is Zoom, which is another example of cloud computing. And the fourth industrial revolution is generally agreed to be a fusion between technology, uh, physical, digital, and biological worlds, right? So, so those three worlds uh, merge. Now, just for a counter argument, this is a paper written by my uh, professors in University of Nicosia, implications of artificial intelligence and blockchain as drivers for the fourth human revolution. And they describe human revolution in four phases. The first phase was about uh, 40,000 years ago where we invented language, fiction and art. And the second uh, human revolution was the advent of the agricultural revolution. So the domestication of farm animals and plants uh, that gave rise to excess production 
And that was the first forms of money because you put a shekel of wheat in the local temple and the, the high priest would give you a copper coin which you could trade. So, you know, commerce came about there and it was quite important. And then the third human revolution is where we move from the dark ages into modernity. And it's generally accepted that it's after the pubonic plague, which helped kickstart the Renaissance uh, with science and engineering. And the first of those people would be like Leonardo da Vinci and, and so on. And then this paper in the fourth human revolution, it has an optimistic view that we will augment uh, ourselves with technology and make our lives better when we reach the singularity. So let's have a look and see what is the singularity and, and we'll make a prediction. The singularity was uh, first coined by a famous mathematician called John von Neumann. And he describes it as the ever accelerating progress of technology and changes made in human life, which gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them could not continue. Okay. And this is another important guy you should know if you don't know him, it's Ray Kurzweil. He's kind of uh, taken center stage with singularity by writing his book and he makes a prediction around 2045, the pace of change will be so astonishingly quick that we won't be able to keep up. Okay, so let's look at the case for the singularity. We have artificial intelligence will initiate explosive technolo technological growth resulting in incomprehensible changes to uh, human civilization. And we've got intelligent systems that will create accelerating self-improvement cycles. In other words, they're self-upgradable, causing an intelligent explosion. And we also have artificial intelligence continues to upgrade itself. Technology would advance at an incomprehensible rate if it can upgrade itself. Uh, at some point, machines will become more intelligent than humans, and then we'll have the singularity. And at that point, we cannot predict the outcome, whether it be good or bad or indifferent. And the consequences of the singularity are hotly debated. So you have Ray Kurzweil, which I mentioned earlier, claims that humanity will transcend its limitations of the human body and brain, and we can upload our conscious to the internet and we live for hundreds of thousands of years. And, and I don't know about you, but the, the prospect of me being 200 years old, just I can just imagine what an insufferable bore I would become, but that's his view. And then you have the likes of uh, Stephen Hawking and, and Elon Musk claim that singularity could lead to, to human extinction. So counter argument for that is Ray Kurzweil. Did he forget Gödel's incompleteness theorem? And Gödel was a German mathematician and he's, he's proof still stands today. And he proves that there could be no human thought that does not rely on some reality outside itself. So in other words, it's in relation. And um, simply said, no machine can usurp the human mind. And I credited George Gilder there because George Gilder was a friend of uh, Ray Kurzweil, used as an argument. Um, against uh, Kurzweil. And while the singularity is, is hotly debated, singularity could force each of us to contemplate the very existence of human nature, right? Uh, and do we have the right questions to ask about existence? One of my favorite philosophers is a guy called Alan Watts, and he describes um, existence as relationship, just more like what Gödel says. Um, and Watts goes on to say, like Aristotle says, wonder is the beginning of philosophy and describes wonder as a feeling. So perhaps it's not about asking questions about existence, perhaps it's about a feeling and the relationships with our environment. So I need to stop now because I'm out of my depth, but just keep in mind how quickly we move from a technology conversation into a philosophical conversation on existence. And that's the effect the singularity could have on each of us. So back to terra firma, uh, I want to talk to you about Moore's law. Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel. And in 1965, he observed that transistors on CPUs doubled approximately every two years and halved in price. So the more transistors you put on a CPU, it means it can do more work in the same amount of time. So I'm going to paraphrase and say, CPUs double the speed every two years and a half in price. And there's lots of examples of Moore's law throughout this, this example. So when you have, there, that's hyperinflationary, hyperdeflationary effects. So it's hyperinflationary in terms of compute. So compute gets faster and it gets cheaper at the same time. So I'm not going to go through all this graph, but look at the middle one here, you got the Power Mac, I'll start there. In 2000, the Apple Power Mac was the first PC to reach 1 billion floating point operations per second. So a floating point is we take a number that's 1.234, a long stringy number, and add it to another long stringy number. And the Apple Mac, Power Mac 64, was the first PC to be able to do a billion of those per second. So that just gives you an idea where we were 
uh, 20 years ago. It's predicted then in 2015 that computers surpass the brain power of a mouse, and in 2023, uh, it's predicted to surpass the brain power of the human brain. And as you can see here in 2050, 2045, it's predicted will reach the singularity. And just to prove a point, this is an old ad from the 80s. You can see a 10 megabyte computer was almost $6,000. Now, in fairness, it did include a dot matrix printer. And you can see a Lenovo uh, ID pad is about $1,050, and it's probably 10,000 times faster. So let's look at the other angle from the human revolution. So 15 billion years ago, we had the Big Bang. And about 10 billion years ago, we had life in multicellular uh, organisms. 800 million years ago, we had a, a, a kind of Cambrian explosion, if you like, plants and, and reptiles. Uh, 3 million years ago, we had the hominids. Uh, 100,000 years or so, the Homo sapien. Uh, 50,000 years ago, we invented uh, culture art. 12,000 years ago, uh, agriculture. Uh, 500 years ago, the printing press about 40 years ago, the PC. So where are we headed? And we're, we're headed to this singularity, right? So as you can see along the bottom, human intellect is, is increasing kind of linear, and this is the exponential graph of technology. So what does that mean for the human race? As I said, we kind of need to turn to philosophy to kind of understand what existence will mean if, if we become transhuman. And uh, I, I have more questions and answers than I have for this. Like, Will some people experience the singularity before other people do? And will we all have the same experience when we do? Um, and I think some people will reach their singularity before others. And, and I'm going to put you in the, the presentation later on. I think somebody already has met the singularity, right? Um, so we can discuss that. Let's look at the social implications of the singularity, right? Which are job displacement, mass unemployment, rising inequality and social unrest. And one can argue we're probably going to have that now with this whole virus scenario. So we look at The Economist, right? A study finds that nearly half of jobs are vulnerable to automation. Uh, similarly, 47% of jobs are automated by 2034 and government is not prepared. Um, CNBC say automation is threatening 25% of jobs in the US, especially boring, repetitive ones. And then we have uh, the Futures magazine says production soared after this factory replaced 90% of its employees with robots. So when I look at this, it begs the question to me, if no one has a job, who will have the purchasing power to buy the goods produced by the robots? Okay. And I look back through history and I think of Henry Ford uh, about 100 years ago. The Ford plant in about 1913, 1914 in Michigan was a horrible place to work. Right, workers would go that have a repetitive job to do every day. They were bored, silly, and also uh, workers lost fingers, hands. They got chest punctured by machinery. So, from health and safety, it was an absolute nightmare to, to work there. So, Ford looked at the, and this was a problem because what happens if if somebody walked off the production line, production stopped. So, it was costing Henry Ford a lot of money. So, he looked at it and brought in some work practices, brought in an eight-hour day, better work conditions and he doubled everyone's salary from about $250 to $5 a, a day. And the knock-on effect was um, the uh, factory started to produce uh, um, a lot of cars, and it was an unintended consequence in that both GM and uh, Chrysler also had to do the same. Now, what happened here was the workers then got a sense of pride in their work and a sense of pride in working for Ford and went out and were able to afford to buy cars. So there was actually an auto uh, explosion, if you like, in, in the industry, which caused um, a, a, a market boom. So the question I'm asking, maybe we need to consider something like this. If we're going to kind of automate production, uh, how do we pay people? Um, is it enough that we have universal basic income? Uh, I would argue no, because universal basic income is just that it's basic income. And if you map that to the Ford workers, the Ford workers had basic income in their old job, where they were able to kind of afford food and shelter, but didn't have safety at work. They didn't have any sense of, of self-esteem, a bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and when Ford invested in his workforce and, and, and uh, they returned in favor by giving him a, a better production line, a market boom, a knock-on effect. And I think we kind of need that, that same type of thinking uh, when we look at the social implications for the singularity. This is a website. And by the way, I should mention, I will be sharing these slides in PDF. They'll be going out later. But this is on Bloomberg, where you can type in your current job and see what risk you are at, at uh, losing your job through automation. 
And you can see here, the most vulnerable ones are cashiers, waiters, retail sales, loan officers, credit analysts, accountants, uh, comp and benefit managers. They're at about the 90%. And even though know, we move to like 50%, computer programmers have a 50% chance of losing a job because as I mentioned, these AI systems will be able to program themselves, right? So they could end up being redundant. Let's um, move on and look, look at exponential technologies. Now, this is another quote from Ray Kurzweil here. And he says, our intuition about the future is linear, but the reality of information technology is exponential and that it makes a profound difference. If I take 30 steps linearly, I get to 30. If I take, take 30 steps exponentially, I get to a billion. Okay, these are 12, and it could be more, but these are 12 exponential technologies that I'm aware of, right? With IoT, AI, and blockchain, which we're going to talk to today, and you've got robotics, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, 3D printing, molecular technology, new materials, energy storage, like even our batteries that we use today in cars are still based on batteries we invented in the 1800s. We have another new technology there. Autonomous vehicles, of course, genetic engineering, and uh, quantum computing. Now, Charles, do you want me to stop here and take for questions while I keep going? Typically, I stop at the end of a singularity and get onto IoT. At the moment, we haven't got any questions in the chat. If anybody would like to put any in the chat or even in YouTube, I know we've got a slight delay on there. Um, okay. You know, be happy to answer any calls. But at the moment, no, no, no questions. Great. Okay, I'll move on to IoT. So, Internet of Things is a network of physical devices embedded with sensors, software, and connectivity, and you can see the exponential growth. We have between four and eight billion in 2017, and this year's projects between 30 and 50 billion. And this is the first many to one technology. And what do I mean by that? When we had computers, we had one computer to many people. And then when we had mobile phones and smartphones, we went to one to one with technology. And now IoT sensors have gone many to one. So you'll have many sensors for, for one person. And if we look at IoT applications, I'm sure you're all familiar with these. We've got the smart home. So on my, my iPhone, I can turn on a light socket from where I'm not here. You've got wearables for GPS tracking, life jogging, and connected health for blood pressure and so on. In the enterprise, we're able to track and monitor production lines, manufacturing, uh, agriculture, we're able to measure humidity, precipitation, soil content, that type of thing. Uh, energy, we're able to turn electrical grids into smart grids. Uh, we're able to equip buildings with sensors to control energy costs in the building, uh, servicing like the AC units or actuators and pumps, that type of thing. Uh, and transportation, we use for tracking goods through supply chain, such as um, GPS location, uh, gravity shock, so th the goods can take a fall, seal tamper uh, proof, and temperature. And brings us on to our next section, which is artificial intelligence. And I'm going to give you the textbook definition of artificial intelligence first. So AI refers to the theory of development of the computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and translation between languages. That's the textbook definition. But in reality, or in practice, AI is, is whatever has not been done by computers, right? It's more of a concept in our minds. And if you go back to 1990s, uh, certainly when I was in college and coming out of the workforce, it was, uh, it was optical character recognition and playing chess, right? We were obsessed about beating chess players. And it wasn't until 1996 that IBM's Big Blue played Gary Kasparov and won the first match. Now, Gary won the, um, the, the tournament overall 4-2, but the first game out, Deep Blue won. And that was, that was a temporal marker, right, in, in IT history, maybe even in human history, because up to then it was just, just a concept. It was like um, Charles C. Clarke, AI was just something in a book, but it actually happened where a computer beat our best. And um, the difference back then, it was to play Gary, it was a brute force attack in that IBM Big Blue would do, would calculate about 100 million uh, positions per second, and it could go maybe 20 moves deep. But it wasn't particularly anything smart, it was just more uh, work out the moves and, and the probability. There was a rematch in, in uh, 1997, and IBM doubled their performance to 200 million moves per second. And in that game, IBM's Deep Blue won the tournament. And I think it was three and a half to two and a half because there was a draw there. And it was, it was a bit contentious because Gary accused them of being cheating, which they didn't. But anyway, and if we look, um, 
where we are today. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the game Go based out of uh, Korea and Asia. I think it's a Chinese game, but, but the Koreans now seem to own it. There was a, a, a project and it's on YouTube, AlphaGo, who beat the world champion Lee Sedol. And the difference between AlphaGo and IBM Deep Blue is uh, AlphaGo was bootstrapped or taught how to play the game with over 13 million moves, 15,000 games, it played other humans and played other machines. So it actually was ready, if you like, it was in training to play Lisa at all. And it learned from experience. In other words, it reprogrammed itself, which is what Deep Blue couldn't do, okay? And um, if you ever look, uh, if, if you look at um, uh, that um, documentary with Lisa at all, he is my character, who I think, who has reached his singularity, right? He came, he had his singularity early. Because it, let me just paraphrase, right? Um, you know, imagine you're Lisa Dahl and, and uh, a nerdy data scientist turns up to your doorstep with a laptop asking to play your computer, right? And Lee was quite confident of winning, has been kind of winning all his life. He was a top world player. And his whole world was turned upside down when he lost 4 1, right? You could see it in the movie, he was visibly upset. Uh, to the point that in 2009, he retired from, from playing golf because he just cannot compete with AI. So I'm putting it to you, the audience, to see what you think. I think, you know, that's what the singularity was for Lisa Dahl. He got there earlier, and maybe something like that could be in store for us. Okay. In 2020, I think AI is autonomous cars and robots because we we're, we're tantalizingly close to cracking autonomous cars. And what's stopping us? And it, it's really data, right? So let's unpack the logical structure for AI. Because when people talk about AI and machine learning, what does it actually look like? And I want you to imagine uh, AI like an analogy for the Atlantic Ocean, a big ocean, the Pacific Ocean, wherever you like. AI and machine learning is just the first meter of the surface below. So the first meter of water is AI. And then the analytics layer is maybe the next 10 meters below that. And the data is everything from, let's say, 11 meters right to the bottom of over 2,000 meters and, and getting deeper. So artificial intelligence is a massive amount of data. And you can see from this diagram here, we collect the data, we store the data, we kind of clean it, and we put it into an analytics engine. And then a small layer of AI deep learning is on top to try and make some sense out of this data. And i give you a quote from, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ocean Protocol. They're another crypto project based on data science and AI. And these guys suggest that autonomous driving needs 500 billion miles worth of driving data, which would take a single company like Toyota 20 years to, to acquire. And without going into it, they reckon they have a solution in this space. And uh, that's a quote from Trent McConaughey uh, almost two years ago when he was talking about uh, autonomous driving. So, so artificial intelligence is massive amounts of data, uh, analytics, and a small amount of intelligence. So when you hear it's a, it is a meme and it's also true, big data equals big business. So that's why the likes of, of Google, Amazon, Facebook, all these guys are in the lead because they have data. And when you have any of these startup businesses, they're, they're more hungry for data than they are money. And that said, um, Fortune reckons that AI will be a 15 trillion plus business by 2030. And just to put that into context, the world's GDP is about $85 trillion. So, so AI is going to be about 18 to 20% of, of world GDP. That, that's how big artificial intelligence is going to be, and it'll all be driven data. Um, artificial intelligence opportunities. So we've got digital assistants, which we all use already. We've got Siri, we've got Alexa. Healthcare, you know, artificial intelligence has been in healthcare since 1972. Right, there was, there was a, a, an expert system was called back then called Mycin that helped doctors uh, diagnose blood diseases. Uh, cybersecurity, we use it in our for cybersecurity to spot and fix breaches by, by analyzing lots of log files and looking at anomalies and so on. Um, agriculture, using drones for crop and soil and rain analysis and predicting yield or diseases in, in terms of crops. Uh, robots, as we know, are getting smarter and more agile. I'm sure we've all seen the Boston Dynamic videos uh, online spot, the one that looks like a dog and the one that looks like the Terminator. Um, geospatial, we're using AI to find complex trends and relationships between people and places. Um, legal, we're looking at AI to automate standard legal contracts. 
And we're looking at new computer interfaces, Google Glass, which is quite old by now, but we're looking also at, at, at non-invasive brain interfaces. And we're looking at potentially new business models, such as a self-driving company, the Taxi DAO. I'm sure some of you are familiar on that. I, I, uh, more on that later. Uh, I'm going to move on to blockchain. Any questions there, Charles, before I move on? Yeah, we've got a number of questions in the chat box. Um, yeah. Do you want me to read them out to you? Yeah, please. Uh, what would be a good educational path to take to be part of this journey? Machine learning, applied AI, or data sciences, or a mixture of the both? Well, they're, they're all interlinked, right? So um, it, it depends on what you want, right? Uh, so if you look at, at uh, uh, data scientists, right, they, they try and extract uh, valuable data, whatever that is, if it's for a business, for science, or whatever, they have to extract it of, of oceans of data, as we've just learned, right? Um, and, and then you have, I, I've got people on my team who just do AI for, for the crack, right? To just program stuff, they can get these little AI PCB boards from uh, uh, NVIDIA and that type of thing. So people do it for a hobby and people do, do it seriously. Um, there's plenty of courses on Udemy, so you don't have to spend a fortune or you could look at, 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 at doing a, a more formal career, if you like. Uh, great answer. Um, Scott asks, I believe you said most people suggest we are currently in the third industrial Re revolution. Yes. When do you think we'll start the transition to the fourth industrial revolution? And is COVID-19 likely to accelerate this switch? Okay, so the prediction, I don't know, but the prediction is Ray Kurzweil says 2045 is what he predicts. If you want, you want a date, okay? Uh, but I have asked the question to Scott, are people going to arrive at the singularity in phases. And I would argue that Lisa Dahl was one of the first of us to reach the singularity because, you know, for him, he was, uh, he's a humble man, but he was top of his game, probably the best in the world of what he did, won most, if not all of these games, went in uh, to a data scientist, right? You can see the guy, I can't remember his name. And uh, he and his team and his computer just, just destroyed him. Right, so he was just not prepared for how well AlphaGo was playing the game. So I'm thinking, or I'm asking the question, maybe we all uh, experience the singularity at a, at a different time, right? Um, so it, yeah, I would say the next 15 years will there be more and more people dropping, or maybe sooner. And the other question, COVID-19, yeah, probably, if you look now, right? Um, I read some article, and, and I think Charles, we were discussing in the intro how well uh, this whole scenario is done for cloud computing, because people just want to work at home and they want to use Zoom and they want to use other, other technologies. So yeah, um, I could see that potentially accelerating it because people are going, to, our companies are going to put more budget towards cloud computing, which will force uh, ourselves, Oracle, for example, and other companies to invest more to, to deliver better goods and services and good, better products. Great. Um, uh, we've, got a, we've got a couple of questions on blockchain, which I'll keep to yeah. the next intermission. Um, yeah, but Brian, nice. yeah, Brian Dealey asks, um, as someone who works in sales, and Brian also works in sales, how susceptible do you think our field is to being automated? Or is there enough of a human aspect to the field where we are relatively safe? Is there enough? Well, so that what's safe, right? So right now it's human to human contact. And I uh, it depends on how complex your product is. If, if your product is simple to sell, you know, you can automate that over telephone using the voice. If it's complicated, that'll be more harder to automate. But even if you look at even what our, our own boss says, Larry Ellison, the reason why we got into machine learning, and, and I'll talk about this later, we put our machine learning algorithms to work in the data center. Because number one, we can't get the skill set, right? So, just, you know, anyone who's starting to do a startup business getting the skill set um, is quite difficult. So you're looking for machines to automate that. Um, also, it, from a cost-effective point, if, if you want to do cybersecurity using machine learning, they're working 24-7, don't complain about overtime, and can analyze a vast amounts, amounts of data. So it'll be a process. I'd suggest, uh, Brian, go look at the Bloomberg link, which I shared, and, and, and type in your job and see if you are susceptible to automation. And then maybe you, know, you need to kind of pivot your career. There's no rush right now, right? So you've got a few years. Um, to see where, where the jobs will lie. And it, it's in medicine, uh, it's in, uh, I think, management. Uh, computer sales, depends. Depends on what you're selling, you know? Uh, I think that's it for this question and answer Great. session. All right, we'll go on to blockchain next. 
Okay, so blockchain. Imagine blockchain as, as a settlement system. Now, I know you guys know more about this than I do, okay? So just for the purpose of people who don't, uh, a blockchain is an open, decentralized, permanent, immutable, verifiable record of truth that everyone can see, and just high level of how it works. We have a ledger, just like an Excel spreadsheet, that's distributed to many blockchain members, which we call nodes, or some people call them peers, and it holds an account and uh, these accounts and the value of these accounts. Uh, the most current block in the chain holds the current state of these accounts and their value, as well as a cryptographic link back to the previous block. New transactions are placed in the next block to be created. For example, Alice sends Bob one crypto token. Uh, a new block is created or mined, right? Uh, when 51% or more of the blockchain nodes reach consensus that the new block represents the current state of the ledger. And in Bitcoin, for example, this takes about 10 minutes. And what would happen there is Alice is decremented one token and Bob is incremented by one token. Okay, and we go back to step one. So that, that's how a blockchain works. That's technical, that's textbook stuff. But I want you to think of blockchain as a security architecture, right? I mentioned George Gilder previously, who was kind of taunting Ray Kurzweil about the singularity. George wrote this book. Uh, I'd recommend you get it, Life After Google. It's, it's a good read. Now, George Gilder, he's an American investor, a writer, economist, uh, techno-utopian advocate. So he's on the plus side, that we're all going to be, good, all going to be great. Uh, he's a co-founder of the Discovery Institute. And he says, security is not a procedure or a mechanism, it's an architecture. And I would agree with him on that. And he says, the cryptocosm will start by defining the ground state, and the, the ground state is you. Uh, blockchain technology will address the doldrums of centralization, insecurity, and the cirrhosis affecting the current information economy. So let me unpack that here. What George, he attacks Google, and it's not my place to attack Google coming from, from Oracle, but he attacks Google's free services. He says their free services avoid liability requirements, uh, sorry, liability requirements of security to its customers. So for example, um, Google or even Facebook, the, you know, your, your, your user ID and password was spilled onto the internet. How do you sue anybody? Because the service was free, right? And he reckons or predicts that Google's current business model, which is Web 2.0, is ending. And it will lead away to Web 3.0, or the cryptocosm, as he calls it, uh, where security will give us trust and, and we can build that trust around you, right? So that, that's what he sees, um, what, what's coming. And uh, it, this guy predicted the iPhone, right? Now, it wasn't the iPhone, but the, the smart computer or the smart handheld back in 1978. So you have to listen to this guy when he speaks. Okay, so blockchain, you got permissionless versus permissioned. Um, permissionless, anyone could create blocks as long as they obey the blockchain network rules, right? Uh, we cover this, it's open decentralized ledger, permanent immutable, we cover that state of ledger changes in every block. So permissionless is Bitcoin, you know, you can run a node if you want, it doesn't cost anything, it obey the rules, you can even mine if you've got the equipment. Same with Ethereum, we can mine, and I think we'll move in proof of stake in July, soon that happens. You got Polkadot Cosmos. And then permissions. Permission is more appealing to uh, enterprise and financial. Uh, transaction uh, processing is performed by nodes who are given permission to join. So you need to know who's in your, your consensus group. And transactions are private to members only. So only if you're in that group can you see transactions. And even within that, you might not be able to see all transactions, only what's created in your, your private channel. Uh, let's talk about smart contracts, which is you know, people hear smart contracts, think of programmable money. Because uh, smart contracts probably the worst name ever that Nick Zabo, the creator of smart contract, ever picked. Because they're not smart like AI, and they're not contracts like legal contracts. Um, what they do is allow complex, decentralized applications to be built on top of a blockchain to transfer value when conditions are met. So in my pseudo code here, so if paid in full equals true, then supply product. Right? That could be for like for a vending machine. Um, Bitcoin has a simple script language called script. Uh, whereas smart contracts uh, platforms such as Ethereum Solidity has a full application development language. We call that in computer science Turing complete because we can do loops and a lot more sophisticated stuff. And, and that's the difference, uh, a huge difference. So a uh, smart contract example using a vendor sheet machine is we insert a coin into the machine uh, in the belief that the machine will accept our payment, implement a contract by delivering the desired item. So I put in two euro coin, hit uh, C45, I get a bottle of Coke back and maybe some change if I'm looking. 
And that's kind of how smart contracts work. And I want to give you this concept of thin versus fat protocols. So internet protocols such as TCP, IP, HTTP, and SMTP produced huge amounts of value. But most of it got captured in big internet companies like Google, Facebook, and Twitter. And if you wanted to participate in the value of those protocols, you had to go to the NASDAQ and buy shares in Google and Facebook. What blockchain protocols have done, which are built on top of the internet, I might add, is they captured most of the value of the applications running on that blockchain. So the, the dollar uh, value or the market cap of the protocol always grows faster than the combined value of the applications built on top, since the success of the application layer drives further speculation in the protocol layer, if you understand that. And it's much easier for any of us to participate in the uh, protocol layer. So if you can afford a full, full, full Bitcoin, you can buy a Bitcoin, you can buy Ether, you can buy Chainlink, you can buy all these tokens and you can participate in these. Okay, so the question here is, are IoT, artificial intelligence and blockchain converging? So we've seen individually these technologies deserve uh, our attention as they are seen as exponential technologies in their own right. However, when combined, their transformation effect even multiplies and demands that we reimagine the art of what's possible. So we're gonna look at maybe a future trend, a future driven by data. So if IoT, which generates and collects the data, you saw AI, right, is, is to act on this data, but AI is, is, is big data analytics, and then we act on the data. And then we got blockchain to do a settlement of payments and record transactions. And, you know, we've got advanced analytics as a wrapper to empower all of this. So let's look at uh, the future trend. As I mentioned, we got IoT sensors, allow us to cost effectively gather quadrillions of data points per second. Can you just imagine the amount of storage you're going to need for that. And that's going to grow. We're going to need connectivity to allow us to transmit and broadcast this data. In artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence at the very edge of the network would be mini brains, if you like, analyzing the state as it comes in. If you combine that with IoT, you have the ability to recognize meaningful patterns buried in mountains of data in ways that wouldn't be possible for most humans or even non-AI algorithms to do. And then what about acting on this knowledge? Uh, we've got blockchain, distributed ledger technology, which gives us decentralized governments, uh, coupled with no single or central point of failure, it gives us disintermediation, unalterable and searchable records of events. And combine AI and IoT, uh, you have a world of autonomous systems interacting with each other, uh, procuring services from each other, and, and settling transactions, right? So we have all of this going on. So let's have a look at, um, at what this future technology stack looks like. And, and before I unpack this, uh, I want to talk to you about Bell's Law. You remember Moore's Law, it says every two years, uh, CPUs double in speed and half in price. Well, Bell observed, well, after 10 years of Moore's law, computers get so fast and networks get so fast, we need a whole new architecture to take advantage of this uh, new technology. And this is what I present to you today. Um, we have uh, IoT, as we discussed, linked into AI, and AI uh, sides of just any kind of uh, transaction setting to happen with which goes into smart contracts and digital money. So let's look at a new era for commerce based on that model. With digital currencies create new forms of money. Yes, we have fiat money, we have pounds and dollars and euros, but there's other things that can, the tokenization of assets, which is a, a, a form of money. It could be commodity money, right? As, as well as, as fiat money. Um, it's programmable and active money for machines. So we can even, you know, uh, uh, top up our robots to go trade on our behalf, right? Smart robots, you could actually send it down shopping if you wanted, right? Uh, we've blockchain to create a new internet layer, an internet layer of trust. And we've got uh, disintermediation across industries, particularly finance. And the consequences of this would be vast, right? Money will be transacted in nano quantities and will lead to machine to machine and human to machine commerce, which I call nano finance. Uh, we've got autonomous AI-based economic agents will emerge. And then we have um, cloud-based autonomous organization will be made possible, right? I'm going to call this the Taxi DAO. Um, those of you in the crypto community know what a DAO is. It's a decentralized autonomous organization. I'm going to break out to the internet, if this works, and read you uh, this section of what a Taxi DAO is. Um, I hope you can see that. Actually, no, it's on this screen. Here we go. So imagine a self-driving taxi company uh, in the not too distant future, customers can call it taxis using an app similar to Uber app 
Uh, once a taxi is ordered, it automatically picks up the passenger and drives him or her to the requested destination. Car automatically takes the best route, avoiding traffic detours. Once the passenger leaves the taxi, the money is automatically transferred using a smart contract. The money that is received with the service is then used to automatically service the car if needed. Once the car notices a service required, it automatically books an appointment with a car service station. The repairman automatically and immediately receives a report what needs to be done and if any parts need to be ordered. After years of great service, the car notes it has reached its end of life and automatically drives itself to the car recycling company. Um, sometime after that, smart contracts order a new self-driving car based on demand as it sees in the market. The moment the old car is recycled, the new car leaves the factory and picks up the first passenger. There's no manager, no employee will be involved in the entire process. So it's big data analytics is used to automate, automatically improve the service, understand the customer, and monitor the cars. So that's an example of a, an autonomous AI driven uh, company where there's no human involvement other than humans could, could be shareholders, but there's, there's, there's no need. Uh, and that's potentially a new era of commerce for us. So let's look at our um, main opportunities, which are also challenges. Uh, we need to upgrade systems um, from legacy to blockchain native systems. I mean, I think we'll all agree that the IBM mainframe has had its heyday, but yet you can go to IBM's website today and buy a brand new mainframe. So the legacy won't disappear. It will improve, you know, as part of a layer and blockchain AI, AI and IoT will be on top of that. Um, we'll of course need to integrate and, and do interoperability and have backwards compatibility with these systems. And we're gonna to have to retrieve return on investment and bootstrapping to these systems. We have to kind of fund them and, and get them going and also securing the future technology stack, right? Um, secure oracles such as Chainlink, right? Which is a security service, will bring reliable data to smart contracts to settle on. So, so a secure oracle such as Chainlink will attest to the data going into your smart contract. So it'll give you that confidence to execute. Um, also I've asked the question of, of, of digital, digital identity for IoT and robots. I see a time where the government will, will make you get a digital ID for your robot, much like you have a, a car license. Because a robot, particularly a, a physical robot, like a drone or one that's got legs, will interact with human society and it will need to record a log of what it does and when it does it and digitally sign it, it did that action so it can't be altered, right? So I can see legislation coming in the next 10 years uh, forcing robots to have ID and as well as IoT sensors. So imagine you have IoT sensor, sensors in a valley beside a river to detect flood detection and so on. What happens if somebody hacks the IoT sensors to pretend there was a flood such that it would trigger a smart contract payout, right? So we've got kind of security there. So that, that's big business from what I can see. Um, as mentioned before, we're going to need advanced analytic capabilities. Uh, as devices at the edge become smarter, uh, smart contracts will require more advanced analytic capabilities to make sense of the data coming into it. OK, um, and data driven analytics, I think, would become the middleware for the Internet of Trust, right? To, to kind of take in all this data, make sense of it, understand what's real. And so we can actually trade against that. Uh, new business models. Uh, disruption innovation will dominate, but will be boom burst cycles of big failures along the way. You remember back, for those of you who do, uh, 99, 2000, we had the, the, the dot com, right? Uh, a lot of people burst, but we had some like Amazon came out of that. Google came out of that. Uh, Facebook was, actually, no, that wasn't, that was 2005. But, you, but there was a whole plethora of, of, it was a car crash of companies, right, uh, that went bust. But uh, we got some big companies out of that. Something similar, I think, will happen with, with blockchain. And winners will not be the one focusing on efficiency gains. So what do I mean by that? Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb by making a more efficient candle, right? He went something completely separate and turned it on its head. So implications for this, for you, right? It might, I think you need to read and research continuously. Most losers will come from the ranks of the unaware and the reckless. So educate yourself on the benefits of IoT, AI and blockchain and see how you can benefit. And uh, we touched on this earlier, uh, develop a future ready corporate vision and strategy. So uh, prepare, be prepared to pivot your organization or even yourself in the right direction at the right time. Somebody was asking about, uh, will automation take my job? If you stay ahead of the curve, no, it won't. Um, time your tactical decisions carefully, easier said than done, to be honest. But um, 
in an era of fat protocols, much value will be created early on, high risk, high return. Uh, avoid investors at over high technological junctures, and that's not financial advice, right? Okay, I'm gonna talk now where does Oracle fit into the fourth industrial revolution? So before I do that, I need to talk about our, our mission statement, which is to help people see data in new ways, discover insights, and unlock endless possibilities. But the key words are there, people, data, insights equals endless possibilities. So when we look at AI and machine learning uh, in Oracle, it's powered by what we call enterprise data. And we at Oracle consider ourselves the enterprise data company. Um, our technology underpins trillions of dollars of assets. Uh, you think of all the major financial institutions, governments, banks, healthcare, uh, we have a, a pretty healthy portfolio of companies. And we're known for our database and we're known for supply chain. And uh, we help customers shift an awful lot of value. So we've applied our machine learning algorithms to that data set. And where you'll find it is in our autonomous database. Um, we've got 40, nearly 41 years worth of uh, knowledge running a database. And right now you can, we we'll just have to ask you five questions to provision an enterprise Oracle database. You want to know the name of the database, the username for the admin, the password for the admin, how many CPUs you want and how many terabytes you want, and we'll do everything else. So we, we can do patching and scaling, performance management and backups. We also do the same for autonomous Linux, which is 100% IBM Red Hat compatible. Uh, we'll do pa uh, patching and scaling there. As I mentioned earlier, we've increased cybersecurity in our cloud by using machine learning to detect anomalies in terms of what can happen to prevent outages and security breaches. And we've also embedded machine learning into our analytics cloud, our enterprise resource planning, customer engagement, manufacturing, and human capital management systems to give users predictive analytics. And they don't even have to touch any machine learning. We do that all for them. And uh, I, I referenced Larry before, that's his speech down here from, from Open World 2018. He says, we have to use machine learning to cut costs, manage complexity, increase security, and uh, lessen the dependency on getting access to qualified staff, because we just can't get them. And we have one piece of visible machine learning, and that's on our autonomous database, where we have uh, machine learning notebooks, which is a common interface or collaboration tool using all machine learning. And it's for data scientists and, and data analytics who want to get in and get access to the data and do their own machine learning. But as you can see there, most of our uh, machine learning is hidden. You know, it's done properly as a, either a PaaS or a SaaS service where, where the user doesn't have to get their hands dirty. In blockchain, we're committed to the Hyperledger Fabric open source platform. Uh, Oracle Blockchain has a huge focus on integration using REST APIs for our own products and, and third parties. And as mentioned before, chain link integration is expected in Q3 2020. So we'd be part of that. So that's what a lot of our customers and startups love about our, our blockchain product is they don't they just get straight in and write their chain code. They don't have to do any kind of admin or any of that type of thing. And it's been hugely popular. Um, so as I said, yeah, our blockchain it's pre-assembled, you don't have to do anything, it's open and interoperable. It'll talk to other uh, hyperledger fabric systems uh, that are not Oracle related as long as we're in the same version range, plug and play integrations, as I mentioned, enterprise grade, and we do all the automated DevOps free on that platform. So all you have to do is, is, is write your chain code. And you can have it running in our cloud or you can do on-prem. And next one then is machine learning and enterprise data. You now know this already, right? So you've got data marks, we call it, right? Enterprise data being fed into machine learning to give you analytics and predictions, right? And where would it be if I couldn't give you something for free? So we have two free trial options. The first one is always free. These are services you can use for an unlimited amount of time, plus free credits for 30 days to allow you to explore and build for free. So what's for free? Two autonomous databases limited to 20 gigs each, two virtual machines, um, 120 gig of storage, load balancer, and some uh, monitoring tools. And you can get that at oracle.com forward slash cloud slash free. And then I suppose the reason how, why we came together is of course Oracle Startups. Oracle Startup is a global program. Uh, I'm not part of Oracle Startup, but I, I'm governed by them if you like. So the Oracle Startup program will give you access to Oracle technical resources such as myself and my team and product management. We give you free credits to kick off and we give you a heavy discount or raise card for up to two years. 
uh, you've got access to Oracle Marketplace, so you can deploy your own apps and we can bail on your behalf. So you don't have to worry about setting up uh, credit lines and that kind of stuff with, with our customers. And if we think your product is good enough, right, and we'll introduce it directly to our customers. And we, we've got startups, we've done that too. And we'll give you go-to-market support, right? So um, Charles and the Chainlink team will attest that we've offered uh, our facilities that you can run meetups and so on. And I said, Chainlink are members of the startup program. So does anybody out there who are um, uh, thinking, or have already started a startup, right, so to say, uh, uh, reach out uh, to us and sign up. And uh, if you're based in the UK and Ireland, you work with me and my team. Right, key takeaways, so we can finish up. Uh, are we at a historical juncture in time? Is the fourth industrial revolution, is it gonna happen? Uh, and will we have a singularity? And if we do, what will be the impact? IoT, AI, and blockchain smart contracts will lead the way. We're going from the Internet of Information, Web 2.0, to the Internet of Trust, which is Web 3.0. And that will give us machine to machine and human to machine commerce, nano finance, right? Uh, we'll have new forms of cooperation, code only, autonomous. Um, and what are the implications for economic growth and social disruption? Is universal basic income by taxing a robot? Is it enough? I don't think so. Um, I think a new way of thinking is required that we, we, we uh, nurture the human spirit and we feel wanted and included. And that's it. That's it for me. So here's my contact details. Uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn. And uh, I want to say thank you to the Chainlink community. And we'll do Q&A now. Charles? Yeah, fantastic. That was really good, Ian. Uh, excellent high-level overview. I think that's perfect. Uh, certainly get people's brains fired anyway. Uh, we've received quite a few questions in the last uh, five or so minutes. Um, so actually an early one from Tuatara. Sorry if I butchered that name. Um, how do you see the energy industry incorporating blockchain technology? Um, well, one of the, the few projects I know, I think it's a power ledger. They're able to record who contributes power. Right, so you got you got power providers and you got the, the, the grid, the, the national grid, right? Which, um, we call it air grid in Ireland. I don't know what you call it in, in the UK, but they have multiple suppliers, right? Five or six suppliers, are, and they even have people at home with a solar panel that might contribute. So transactions of what's contributed to the grid are written, and for not necessarily for everyone to see, but if they ever questioned that who contributed what power to the grid, they get uh, fair pay. So it brings transparency to the uh, to the power power grid. That that's one example. Absolutely fantastic. Um, everyone's uh, the feedback already is, is everyone loved your presentation already. Thank you. Uh, everyone thought it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, Dominic G, um, if someone is interested in jumping industries to the blockchain field, what yeah. advice would you give them if they're not a master of programming? Well, I'm not a master of programming, even though I have a computer science degree, right? So don't let that stop you, right? Uh, I realized maybe second year in college that there were people much better at development than me, right? So I, I did a BSc in, in applied computing and then I figured, you know what, I'm good at technology and business. So if you want to get into blockchain, uh, and I should, probably should put up a link there, the master's degree I did had a, a free module, the first module, which is an introduction to um, uh, digital technologies with the University of Nicosia in Cyprus. It's called a MOOC, Massively Open Online Course. And it runs, I think, three times a year, if not four times a year. It's a 12 week course, easy pace, you get a certificate at the end and your certificate is recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain, which is, which is pretty cool. And that gives you, you know, an overview of how the technology works. You don't have to be a developer. So, you know, if, if you're not that way inclined, you know, some of the Bitcoin uh, modules of, pr of proof of work can be a bit hard, but there are other parts as well that can balance that. So I think that would give you a good overview of blockchain. And then, you know, I did that and I enjoyed it. And then I decided, you know what, um, I need to have a look at this because there was, modules there on finance and banking and stuff I knew nothing about, which, which I'm glad I did, including uh, regulation and law. And when I looked at that course, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I thought I want to pull my toenails out of the pliers to do that course. But I got in, I loved it. I, I didn't think I would, uh, but I enjoyed it. So it's about finding your passion, finding what you're good at. Uh, because the MOOC is free, right? It doesn't cost you anything, only time. So I, I would recommend that. Uh, yeah, great bit of advice. I've actually sat on a few of the Andreas Antonopoulos uh, yeah, webinars that he's yeah. done. Yeah. Really, he's really interesting course, stuff. Yeah. 
Uh, absolutely brilliant. I, I highly recommend mm. the University yeah. of Nicosia. Um, Sasha's got a question. Um, mm. How high is your client's interest in blockchain services right mm. now? Or is this something you've had to propose to your clients to kind of educate? Them? Yeah, so it it is. Here's here's a, here's a solution. Uh, now let's go find a problem. It's, it's a bit like that, right? So where we find it is we rarely sell blockchain on its own, right? So if you want to look at, 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 at ERP, for example, right? And I was shocked when I discovered this. So you have two ERP systems, and I don't even have to be Let's say you have Oracle and, and SAP, our competitor. When two companies, big companies, want to order stuff off each other, one ERP system spits out a C, an Excel file, CSV, just a text file, and the other company imports it. Now, as an IT professional, the risk there is just huge. Not that somebody would would maliciously change a record, but you know, a ten could easily become a hundred uh, uh, accidentally. So what happens then is, is reconciliation happens on, on both sides. If you bring in a blockchain system there, which records and brings a level of trust, as we spoke about, it removes the need for uh, reconciliation. Excuse me, and it it, um, uh, it uh, saves costs and 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 business happens quicker. So we see it, uh, blockchain going in as, as a kind of a, a solution in that regard. And then on our startups, right, they start off because they want Hyperledger or whatever it was, they come in, they buy it. And we know, right, nine times out of 10, they'll be back to us in three to six months wanting analytics which, which on, on that platform. Because blockchain itself is, is, is quite hard to see. But we are able to plug in our analytics platform and give them all sorts, uh, take a data graph out and plot against that. Um, so it's, we typically put in blockchain, first and then with our database and analytics thereafter and supply chain they're they're the biggest use cases we have so remember we're you know if, if salesforce are to cx right if they're number one we're number one in the erp cloud so we have a huge erp install base and um to the point it's not instant the people don't say well give me blockchain it's like okay i understand what it does people have to integrate it into their platforms and understand where the business value comes from yeah so it's a solution set Hope that answers the question. Okay, right, yeah, great answer. Um, Bropo um, has asked, out of all the Oracle solutions, uh, why did Oracle choose Chainlink? Oh, well, Chainlink chose us, I think, right? You have to ask them. So we have a global startup program, right? Uh, which anyone is free to join. Um, and I wasn't there when you guys signed up, so you, you tell me. Um, I, I came across you first in my course, and then quite quickly I saw you on uh, was it Fernando announcing that the, the, the Chainlink Oracle partnership? So uh, I, I got uh, connected then, you know, and you know it's an important partnership, right? So when I have um, people who ask me what is Chainlink, what's it about, and I, I hope you'll forgive me, but I make a rude analogy. I said, well, imagine what the internet was like in the 1990s. No one had a firewall, and, and you know I could type in an IP address, a public IP address, and get a root log on to a government server. That did actually happen. Uh, and then we had the introduction of firewalls, which protected servers. And I say to people, Chainlink is, is a little like a firewall in that regard. So rather than stopping you know, malicious access, it'll stop malicious uh, data or it'll attest to this is good data going into your smart contract. Uh, so the need for, for, for Chainlink for me is a no brainer, right? So uh, people, particularly the supply chain, right? Uh, what's the, um, the Euro USD value right now, particularly for doing international trade. So our customers could go out and ask a chain like node operator to give me that price. I know that it's real, right? And you guys will aggregate that across 20 nodes or whatever. And um, our customers will, will pay for that service. And that's just a simple example. Long-winded answer, but you know. No, 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 perfect answer as far as I'm concerned. Um, so Henry Kingston asks, um, uh, is this combined product of uh, LinkedIn Chainlink and the Oracle services mainly focused at spearheading blockchain integration in industries now? Is this what you're using to go forward? No, there's all types of integration, right? So, so we have internal integration using uh, our own products, right? Where Chainlink is quite specific is is it's a security product, right? Um, first of all, and it will do it'll attest to data off chain to bring it on chain. And, and we don't have a solution in that space and we never will, right? So it's it's um, it's like what I said in that future technology stack. Let me just go back, right? If we can find it, and we can see where, where we fit in. Excuse me now. Give me quicker than that. There we go. 
Okay, so you've got um, IoT data, right? You've got data being put into the AI system, right? Which Oracle lives in there in the enterprise data and we run our machine learning and Chainlink is on the edge here. It'll actually validate the data coming from the AI or the data platform into to the smart contract platform, right? And as the Oracle does not have a dog in that fight. Well, that's just something we, we, we don't do. We may do it, you know, and if we do, we would, it would be buying out Chainlink, right? For example, if, if that were to happen. Um, but right now, that's not our focus. Our focus is enterprise data and always will be enterprise data. And we'll partner with those people and the best people to do that. So I hope that answers the question. Sorry, just muted myself, unfortunately. Um, so another one from Bropo. Um, which use cases um, are Oracle blockchain, uh, sorry, what use cases Oracle blockchain is planning to have regarding Chainlink? So what, which use cases are you gonna be focusing on using Chainlink? Yeah. Well, it would be customer driven and our customers want finance and they want supply chain, right? And, they, and when, when I talk to um, the, uh, what do you call them? The consulting houses, EY, Deloitte and so on, they, they all tend to say, we, we talk a great story, but customers want finance and want supply chain. And that, that's where we exist, right? So we've got uh, ERP, we've got eBusiness Suite, JD Edwards, Oracle Financials, and, and it's, it's, it's big customers. So right now where the money is in enterprise is financial settlements and supply chain, making sure my goods got there. And there's plenty of scope for, for Chainlink uh, to add value to those processes. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, we've got a question that's come in from Yasi. Hi Yasi, by the way, good guy. Um, Ari Jules wrote The Ring of Gaijis Using Smart Contracts for Crime. And it discusses the possible dangers of this great technology. What dangers do you foresee and how do we prevent them? I think the biggest danger to all of us is, is, is privacy, right? Um, it looks like that we're going to get central bank digital currencies. If you listen to, in Europe, Christine Lagarde, her first speech when she took the job leading the IMF, it was digital currencies was on the agenda. She, she could have spoken about anything else, but she chose digital currencies. And they see they're doing that because it's a threat to their products, right? And it's not even Bitcoin. I don't believe Bitcoin is a threat to their business, but stable coins, these, these private coins, such as USD coin, Gemini coin, or USD and, and so on. Um, and if the central banks issue their own currency, we'll all have our wallet, and it could even be an Ethereum token, who knows? Then they will know exactly where and when we're spending. So they'll be able to tie our digital wallet to that cryptocurrency, their cryptocurrency. In our case, it would be the, the, the digital euro. Uh, and they'll know exactly when we're spending it and who we're spending it with. So we need some way to kind of uh, protect ourselves from the central bank spying on us. And, you know, that we can actually transact in privacy if we're ever altered by our, by our uh, revenue services that we can, because it's on a blockchain, we can prove that we're compliant, right? So we can uh, allow access for identities for that particular case. So that's, I think, is, is, is the biggest threat. And that's the dystopian part of, of blockchain or, or, or digital money, right? And uh, people think that Bitcoin is, is secure in terms of identity. It is when it, it's Bitcoin to Bitcoin, but at some point, somebody's going to need a fiat off ramp, right? In other words, sell their Bitcoin for, for dollars or euro or sterling. At that point, the authorities will get them. And uh, it, it came up as a concept uh, called um, colored coins in, in, in Bitcoin, right? A, a different meaning, but if you were um, uh, Ross Ulbricht, right? The Dread Pirate Robert, Roberts who got caught for doing the Silk Road, right? Um, his Bitcoins were dirty, right? The Department of Homeland Security officer, I can't remember his name, a long name. He was able to track Bitcoins go to his account. So if you, if I received, let's say a thousand Bitcoins back, you know, when they were worth 20 bucks or it was from Dread Pirate Roberts, and then go to cash them in, I would have a police officer at my door and said, who's this guy, right? So, so privacy and digital identity, I think are, are uh, to me, what worry me about going for, how we protect our, our, ourselves. Because I think privacy is a human right. So, again, sorry, a long-winded answer. It's absolutely brilliant, I agree with you. Um, final pretty much question comes in from Collective. So from Q3 2020, Will it be a choice for your customers to integrate Chainlink or will it be part of an overall service offering? 
So we'll just offer APIs. I suspect, right, I'm not product manager, but I suspect you'll be able to choose your node link operator. So somebody in the chain link community will offer a price feed or service that you want, and we'll just allow easy connection into that. Right? We'll, we'll just write the, the API interface to make it easy. And so I'd imagine you would type in the IP address or the URL of your chain link provider, and you'll have the necessary security channel set up to, to kind of receive that data. That's my understanding. Fantastic. We'll, we'll just, we'll just, yeah, we'll just facilitate it. That's all. We'll just facilitate it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and a blast from the past. Mr. Henry Ford's jumped into chat. Yeah. And uh, uh, Ian, what's your favorite use case for Chainlink so far? Um, you know, I, the, the one last night on the uh, random function, right? So, wow, because we're talking about computer science. It was always um, one of the things my professors used to throw to us in college, how you generate a random number. And back then I used to program in Pascal. And I said, well, easy to serve. There's a function called random, right? And then uh, that's interesting in terms of gaming. Uh, favorite, uh, favorite use case, um, financial feeds, I think would be good for, uh, I know it's DeFi is quite current, but imagine what we can do with centralized finance, right? With, in terms of the derivatives market and, and that type, of, or even the bond market, the good old traditional bond market, right? Which is where uh, the smart money goes. Uh, a lot of people uh, that I know who work in bond market still use Microsoft Access and Excel, right? Because they have, it's a slower market, but it's a hundred billion dollar market. I think that's ripe for disruption. And a lot of uh, companies I spoke to, particular bigger banks, US banks, looked at smart contract platform and had the issue with um, Oracle feeds, right? And they didn't even use the language Oracle. I don't think they had that in their vocabulary. It's like smart contracts are great, great when you know what the variable, or sorry, what the rate will be in a bond. So if you have a hundred million dollar bond and a 1% annual yield, that's easy. You put in a hundred million over three years and you get a million bucks a year. And the last year you get your hundred million back and your $1 million. But the problem is most bonds are variable. So, and, and the payout maybe every six months. So you write a smart contract, which is locked in. Then the smart contract has to go out and ask an Oracle, what's the Fed funds rate today and feed that in. So they didn't have that, that, that trust mechanism there. They didn't even wear the chain link or anyone did like that. And so, you know, that's a hundred billion dollar market. So we're able to kind of feed into that and offer that type of service. Uh, that's interesting as well, right? Um, because that's ripe for, for disruption. That's one. Um, that answer the question? Brilliant answer. Absolutely brilliant answer. Um, that's pretty much it. Those are all the serious questions. Would you like a silly question? I'll go on then. Okay. Uh, would you rather fire 100 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck, and why? <laughs> Say it again, please. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, would you rather fight a hundred duck-sized horses yeah. or one horse-sized duck and why? Oh, neither, because I brought my bike. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent answer. But well done. Well done. I like that one. Uh, well, seriously, Ian, this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, I think you've given, given a lot of people a lot to think about. And I think they could really see that the future, everything can tie in together and we could really make an exciting future that benefits. Oh, it's a everybody. great time to be alive, you know. Oh, and, and remember Arthur C. Clark, right? You know, we overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can do in three years. I think it's an important time, 2020 to 2022. Well, it's going to be an interesting time for crypto because I think we're still early in that market and we're still developing it. And I think we're a little ahead of it. We've, we've created all these massive tools and, and now that's great. We have to go find problems to match them to. And I think the biggest thing for, for, for me in this community is, is to educate people around you in terms of what this can do. So I think we're in a, a big educational phase. I know I am with my customers. When I deal with them, I just mentioned that bank, right, uh, who, who tried some art contract, didn't work, and didn't even know that, that, that oracles existed and they were secure. So, and these are smart people. And when you tell them about these technologies, they, they, they get it pretty quick. So, the, the, you know, the, the, it's, it's pretty, the learning curve for them is not as steep, which is good. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, 10 out of 10, Ian. Fantastic. The comments, absolutely brilliant. You should probably read the YouTube comments and you'll, really? you know, you, you'll, your head will never get through a door again. It'll be fantastic. It's, <laughs> it's gone really well as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very, very much. All right, guys. Thanks very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. See you in a bit, guys. Thank you, community. See you, everybody. Bye-bye.